Hey everyone, so this video is for my Ceramics 2 students who just completed a few homeworks and are going to have a quiz over that information. This is just a quick review and students, I will be reviewing the document that we normally would have reviewed in class and for anyone interested, this review review document as well as the original homeworks all link in the video description so you could uh, read those more thoroughly if you would like. So students, all right, beginning with the basics of clay. Remember that clay is formed from feldspar and it is through a process called geologic weathering. Now, geologic weathering takes on two different aspects. You either have the mechanical weathering, which is the action of wind and water, which kind of breaks it down abrasively, or, or you would have the action of chemical weathering, which breaks down the feldspar kind of right on the spot. Big difference is mechanical weathering is going to produce clay which is more plastic and chemical weathering less plastic. So mechanical weathering falls into the category of the secondary clays are created from that. Primary clays like kaolin are created through the chemical weathering. Uh, the formula for clay, I am not asking my students to remember this for a quiz. We are high school after all, but it is alumina, silica, and chemical water. So the chemical water is a part of the clay formula until the clay gets fired. Big takeaway is just remember that you can recycle clay over and over and over again until that chemical change happens and that happens during the firing when it reaches around a thousand degrees. Um, hydration is the chemical basically the bonding of the water to the alumina and silica molecules um, a little scientific word in there um, and then the water of plasticity versus chemical water, I just want to address that. Keep in mind chemical water is part of the formula. Bone dry clay, which is not fired, still has chemical water, but it doesn't have the water of plasticity. Remember that the water of plasticity is the wet water that I might physically add to the pug mill when I recycle clay, or maybe when you break up your scrap, you will add moisture to it by uh, squirting or sticking it under water before you put it in your recycling bags. So water plasticity is wet, chemical water is not wet. Um, let's see, clay bodies were developed to control basically the three major properties. So the three properties are plasticity, which is the first stage you would encounter clay. That is working with clay while it's plastic, soft, bendable, and it's workable without cracking. Second stage, or the second property, I should say, of clay, which is the second way that you would encounter it, would be through porosity. And porosity is when clay has to have the ability to dry without cracking. You can increase porosity and control porosity of a clay body by uh, adding certain um, fillers like grog that will help to increase the porosity. If you have a clay body that just is cracking, 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 it might need more porosity. And then our last one is to control vitrification. So you want to control the temperature at which the clay will vitrify and that is these three properties are the three things uh, why clay bodies were developed to control those three properties. Um, also, color can be controlled, of course, through that. Um, let's see. Keep in mind that vitrification is the property that pretty much defines the category that any clay is uh, placed into. It's going to be the temperature of vitrification that makes it uh, low fire or mid fire or high fire. Um, secondary clays and, and primary clays, I kind of touched on it. Secondary is more plastic, so that would be our earthenware and our stoneware. Primary clays are less plastic and that would be like kaolin which is what is the main ingredient in porcelain. Let's see other clays besides our earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain would be such as a raku clay body. Um, the raku clay body that we use is a stoneware clay body. 
And um, although it can go up to like cone six, we are just low firing with the Raku clay body, typically in that low fire range of Raku. Fire clays would be another type of clay that is formulated for firing in kilns. That's what our kiln shelves and the kiln posts are made from, would be fire clays. Terracotta is another type that is a grogged earthenware. Um, it would be like our red earthenware that we have here at school that we use, use in Ceramics One, but really super heavily grogged. Terracotta is sometimes used in very sculptural elements or maybe big terracotta pots. Um, it's got a lot of grog in it, going to be uh, fairly strong when building. That grog helps to um, really kind of support it and make it a little bit stronger than, say, our earthenware that has no grog. Um, Adobe, some of you might have experienced seeing Adobe structures in person. If not, you've, I'm sure you've seen pictures. Uh, if you think about the American Southwest, Adobe is the type of clay that is really put on the exterior of certain structures and it is not fired. Bentonite is the next type of clay. It is very, very, very plastic. Um, it is often added to clay bodies to increase the plasticity of that clay body. And then magnetite is not a clay itself. It's actually specks of iron. Um, sometimes that is added to certain clay bodies to create a speckle effect. And if my students, if you ever wanted to try that, I do have some little... Um, containers of magnetite where you can wedge it in in small amounts in some of your clay if you want to try creating a speckle clay body. Um, okay, next, uh, talking about clay forming, drying, and firing. Just remember that when you are forming clay and you are adding pieces of clay one to another, the most important takeaway that you uh, really need to remember is the clay should be the same moisture content when you're adding them. Um, we score and slip in most cases when we're uh, creating additions onto things. Um, the process of removing air bubbles is wedging by uh, pushing and turning and rotating um, the scrap clay to make it an even consistency. Remember that all clay that is unfired is referred to as greenware. And greenware, of course, has the stages of plastic, leather hard, and bone dry. Bone dry is always when it's cool to the touch, all moisture is gone, and it's ready to be fired. Wear boards are the boards on which we put our uh, pots and pottery, and of course the wear carts. Um, compression is very key and strengthening your clay. Um, you all will hear me constantly talk about compressing, whether it's with your fingers on the rim of something, whether it's with a rib, compression of the clay particles will strengthen your clay and make it um, a lot stronger, less prone to cracking. If you ever say cut an edge of a slab, make sure you go back in there and compress on that edge so it is a little bit stronger. Um, drying. Okay, key takeaway, and you would have learned this in level one, but we're reinforcing this in level two, is slow drying is key because we want the clay to always dry evenly. You don't want it to dry unevenly and have thick and thin parts dry uh, at different times, or you can get cracking from uneven shrinking. Um, Let's see, uh, and one of the things that we do when we put things in our drying cabinets, when you take things either out of your class damp cabinet or out of your damp box, your box that I've made with the plaster in it, uh, when we go to get our forms to be bone dry, we put them in the drying cabinet and then we always protect them um, in some manner when we put them in there so they don't dry too quickly. Maybe a bag hat or one of my favorite ways also is to take a dry towel, like a heavier fabric towel, like a terry cloth towel or something, drape it over it and that will help to hold in some moisture and allow it to dry a little bit more evenly. Protect things like rims and handles, maybe with a little uh, edge of plastic. Um, 
Remember that clay will always shrink as it dries, and our clays are somewhere between 17, uh, seven, I'm sorry, seven and 14%. Uh, typically, higher fire clays do shrink a little bit more. Um, firing, uh, remember that we use pyrometric cones to measure our temperatures. So that's why we refer to things as, oh, that's a cone six glaze, or that's a cone zero five glaze. Because we, instead of using actual temperatures, we refer to it as cones because a pyrometric cone, pyro meaning fire or heat, and metric meaning measure it, it's like a heat measurer, pyrometric cones actually measure the amount of heat work in a kiln rather than a specific temperature. They are designed to bend when they get to a certain temperature and um, I sometimes I will use cone packs in my kiln and a cone pack is when you have maybe three uh, consecutive cones, um, a cooler cone, a target cone, and a guard cone. And the idea is that the um, the middle target cone should just bend just until the tip bends down and touches the cone pack. And the pack is just some uh, clay that I've to hold used. them. Um, let's see. Keep in mind that water vapor is the culprit of most of the problems that happen during firing. If you've ever had a piece blow up, it's because there is too much water vapor in it. Now, what do we do to try to prevent that? Number one, we try not to make the wear too thick. I always tell people, never go beyond three quarters of an inch in thickness. If you go beyond that, it's going to have difficulty drying, especially in our classroom setting when we, we don't have months to dry things out. We just have days and maybe a week or so to dry things out. So three quarters of an inch in thickness or less, if you must go beyond that, then you need to create vent holes to allow the moisture to evaporate. Um, like if someone wanted a thick base and it wasn't hollow, we could vent it with a bunch of uh, holes in the bottom. Sometimes we use my drill, sometimes we use a needle tool to do that. Um, if you ever have trapped air, like you have a totally enclosed form with trapped air, it can be fired without a vent hole, but 99% of the time I tell students to put a vent hole in it for the primary reason it will allow the water vapor to escape. So water vapor turns to steam at 212 degrees Fahrenheit and when it turns to steam it will be very powerful and explosive and it will blow up a piece. Um, let's see, once our pieces have been through the very first firing we refer to that as bisque or bisque wear, and that is the stage at which we do our glazes. And then uh, the last little bit of the page there, this is not on the quiz, but these are just some key things that I'll just reinforce for you all. Um, remember that when you are glazing a piece and you're ready to get it fired, you will always be placing it in our drying cabinet with a kiln ticket and a patty, and I of course have reference videos on how you do that. Um, when you're glazing pieces, if you're brushing, you should be doing three brush coats on a piece that has been rinsed. If you have heavy texture, just do two brush coats. Um, you need to make sure that your glazes are always the correct cone for the clay body you're using. 99% um, of the time in here, in ceramics too, you all are using our stoneware clay body and you're going to be using the stoneware glazes. Um, glazes can be dipped, brushed, poured, or even sprayed, um, but I no longer have the air compressor and the sprayer in here, but I do have a couple of other uh, blower type uh, sprayers that could be used, and I can show you all individually on that. Um, wax resist can be used in a couple different ways. Uh, you can, of course, wax the bottom of something if you're planning on dipping. The wax just helps you to uh, wipe the glaze off more easily. If you wanted to, say, layer different glazes, you could also do wax resist uh, by, uh, say, maybe you 
do one whole coat of a certain color. Then you could put a design on with wax resist. Then you could do another coat over it. And wherever you have the wax resist, it's going to resist that secondary color. Um, remember that the glazes for the most part, when they are properly mixed up and you're going to be brushing, they look very much like a melted milkshake. I have just a handful, a few glazes that have a thicker consistency. They have more of a gelatinous kind of a, a texture, but our target is typically a melted milkshake. Um, if you're going to be using something with food, make sure it's food safe. Um, you can use multiple glazes that are layered one over another as long as they're going to be the same cone, they're compatible, but please pay attention if you have any glazes that have markings or notations on the label, pay attention to whatever that says because some should not go all over a piece or they could be catastrophic in the kiln. Um, let's see, if you are doing underglazes or ongobes, typically they require a clear glaze to be fired over it as well. And uh, that's pretty much it. Students, um, again, you can use the reference paper and uh, I have that linked in the video description for anyone else who wants to see it. So good luck on your quiz.